is that are so hard for her to look at. I just miss him so much. Gladys and Herman Whitfield Jr. missed their son, Herman Whitfield III's smile, his love and affection. I just miss his hugs. He's known to them as Trey, who loves singing and playing the piano. He was always playing music. He was playing, he played the radio, he played his CDs, he listening to music, talking to us about music. But now his mother can hardly listen to it. It brings back painful memories of April 25th, 2022. Other than that being a trigger, just being in our house is a trigger because that's where they killed him. That night, the Whitfields called 911 for help. Hey, did you call? Yeah, what's going on? The son's having a psychosis. Whitfield was walking around his home naked with blood in his mouth in distress. A female officer tries to get him to put clothes on. Backup officers then arrive. When they came in there, it kind of seemed like it started him a little bit. He, so he got up and I was with him, walked through the kitchen going away from them. Unedited body camera video released in January shows the moments Whitfield was tased. From this angle, you see him walking out of his bedroom. Officer Adam Ahmad tries to grab him. Whitfield runs and yells. He tries to grab water, is told to put it down, and heads towards the dining room. He's then tased twice by Officer Steven Sanchez. This edited video, originally released by IMPD, shows when Whitfield enters the dining room. The department claimed he rushed towards the officer. Stay on his head. Whitfield struggles as he's handcuffed. <laughs> I'm holding his head, hold on. He then goes limp. He said, I can't breathe. He said, I can't breathe three times. What was going through your mind at that time? Mm, I was just horrified. The family has filed a wrongful death lawsuit against the city of Indianapolis and IMPD officers. They want to know why their son wasn't turned over after being tased. And the noises and the sounds. They're just with you day and night. His mother also says the 39 year old needed someone to talk to, not use of force. If someone says I can't breathe, that's not a mental health issue. That's a failure to follow policies and procedures. In two weeks, it will be a year since Trey died. The coroner has released her findings. She said it was a homicide. So that's been settled. And she also said the cause of death, that's been settled. But the investigation is still ongoing for IMPD and the Marion County Prosecutor's Office to see if any officers should be criminally charged. What's to investigate at this point? What's, what's going on that it's take, it takes you more, almost a year to investigate something that's all on body cam? And no officers have been charged in Whitfield's death. Wow, Rachel. Well, thank you. And we have a question for you before you leave. So we're wondering, really, the family is calling on the mayor's office as well as the police chief to speak up in this case, right? They are. And I reached out to IMPD. The department says it cannot comment during pending litigation. The mayor's office says its deepest sympathies are with the Whitfield family as they continue to mourn, but it too cannot comment on the case. All right, Rachel. Drivers disregarding school bus stop arms, leaving kids' lives at risk. It's a problem we continue to see in central Indiana. WRTV's Caitlin Kendall is taking a look at one stop in Hendricks County that parents are calling a tragedy waiting to happen. It's very frustrating and, and, and infuriating. Unfortunately, this just keeps happening. Parents from the Williamsburg Village's neighborhood off of 56th Street and Raceway Road in Hendricks County. It makes me angry and upset, and I wish more could be done about it. Rich Garvin reacting to this video, a car blowing past the stop arm of a bus and blaring their horn. Garvin has two school-aged daughters. So you're in the neighborhood, I mean, behind a bus. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty obvious. The, the lights are out. They're, they're big and yellow. There's, there's little kids. This isn't the first time the bus stop at the corner of Jamestown Square and Independence Avenue has had issues like this. In October of 2021, a kid getting off a bus was nearly missed by a car disregarding the stop arm. No rhyme or reason, but it just keeps happening. It's something Michael Estep calls a blatant disregard to the lives of children. 
It's extremely frustrating because my, my kids are my world. It's issues like these that has forced parents to take matters into their own hands. It doesn't take a parent to realize that these children are the future of our, of our nation and our world, and they deserve protection or at the very least caution. Garvin says his family takes their kids to school instead of letting them get on the bus directly across the street from their home. Pay attention and be considerate, and you're especially when you're in the neighborhood. Please just take a second and realize that there's something more catastrophic than being five or ten minutes late. In Hendricks County, Caitlin Kindle, WRTV. Now, we did reach out to the Hendricks County Highway Department because those streets are governed by the county. Officials say they weren't aware of this issue, but will be looking into the safety of that intersection and see if plans can be made to make that area safer. Here's an example of the real-life tragic consequences of blowing by a school bus stop arm. In 2018, a woman crashed into six-year-old twins Mason and Xavier Engel and nine-year-old Olivia Stahl as they were boarding their school bus in Fulton County. All three of those children died. The driver of the vehicle spent time in prison but was released in 2022. So what are the laws when driving near a school bus? Well, on a standard two-lane road, vehicles traveling in both directions must stop for a school bus that has its stop arm extended. On a multi-lane road that doesn't have some kind of barrier, vehicles traveling in both directions must stop. On a divided highway, vehicles behind the bus must stop, but the vehicles traveling in the opposite direction can proceed with caution. And we're following a traffic alert tonight. The new Purple Line construction is now impacting 38th Street on Indy's northeast side, and it will continue to do so for months. Westbound lanes on 38th Street are closed between Emerson and Shadlin Avenues. Only one eastbound lane is open. This project will last 130 days. It will allow crews to complete roadway and drainage improvements. The Purple Line is scheduled to open in late 2024. It will run 15 miles connecting downtown Indy to Lawrence. Hey, Bill just signed into law aims to protect Indiana renters. The major problem it could help you avoid, something that we've seen in Indy over the past couple of years. With the first pick, the Indiana Fever are getting set to lead off the WNBA draft tonight. Fans gathering here at Gainbridge Fieldhouse. I'm Brad Brown. We'll hear from the team's head coach ahead of a very big night coming up at sports. I thought Brad was going to make a prediction right there. Maybe he still will. Uh, as you can see, lots of sunshine. That's been the pattern and will be the pattern until we'll answer that question coming up. From Indie Streaming News Leader, this is WRTV News at 6, streaming now. A new development tonight at 6, a Tippecanoe County Circuit Court judge has ruled Purdue murder suspect Jimin Shaw incompetent to stand trial and has delayed the case. The judge issued an order today saying Shaw is not currently capable of understanding the legal proceedings against him and is not currently capable of assisting counsel in his defense. Shaw is accused of fatally stabbing his roommate Varun Chetta at their Purdue University dorm room in October of last year. A bill signed into law aims to make sure tenants aren't on the hook for unpaid utility bills their landlord is responsible for. The WRTV Statehouse reporter Meredith Hackler joining us now. And Meredith, tell us how this legislation would work and how housing advocates are reacting tonight. Mark and Megan, following the issues the city of Indianapolis had with JPC Affordable Housing and Berkeley Commons LLC, the legislature wanted to make sure tenants wouldn't be put in such a dire situation again. As we've reported, water was shut off at a few different apartment complexes in Indianapolis after the owner didn't pay the bill for months. Senate Bill 114 would allow the utility company to ask for a court-appointed receiver. The receiver would take over the property or properties and make sure the bills are paid. The passage of this bill is something that fair housing advocates say is a step in the right direction, but it's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to addressing the houses, housing crisis across the state. It's a very modest step in the right direction. It really does nothing to protect tenants from evictions, uh, from uh, rent increases, um, and it doesn't do anything to address the lack of affordable housing. 
Advocates say this is the only housing bill so far this legislative session to make it to the governor's desk. Now that the governor has signed this legislation into law, it goes into effect on July 1st. Live in the newsroom, Meredith Hackler, WRTV. Meredith, thank you. The Indiana legislative session is scheduled to last until April 29th, and what's happening there impacts our lives. You want to go to WRTV.com slash politics to see the latest information from the State House. And we're following new developments at 6 o'clock. There's a new effort to prevent former Vice President Mike Pence from testifying about Donald Trump's alleged attempts to overturn the 2020 election. Today, ABC News learned former President Trump's attorneys are appealing the order for Pence to testify before the special counsel in this investigation. This is all about the January 6, 2021 insurrection at the U.S. Capitol as Pence was trying to certify the election results. Last week, ABC News reported that Pence wouldn't appeal the decision to have him testify. So now former President Trump is trying to stop that testimony from happening. This week, the one-stop help site in Whiteland is open once again. The Johnson County town is still trying to recover from a destructive EF3 tornado, which hit more than a week ago. At this site, you can get a driver's license, copies of insurance plans, birth or death certificates, SNAP benefit cards, and much more. Those are some of the documents that may have been lost or destroyed in the storms. The help site is open today through Saturday at the Clark Pleasant School District Administration Building. Well, sunset still two hours away. That means you've got plenty of time to get out and enjoy this beautiful weather, and it continues to get warmer from sunset nearly to sunrise. I don't know if you saw this this morning or not. So often you might be driving and something catches your eye, but Sherry shared this picture with me. It's called a sun pillar and see that vertical kind of shaft of light there that's created by ice crystals floating in the air. They bend to refract the sunlight. And so when the sun's low on the horizon, every once in a while you can see something that cool. Five days, that's our current dry stretch, but add a sixth, seventh, an eighth, and a ninth day to that list as we're likely dry through Friday. When will things change? Indications are we'll see a change over the weekend with the chance for thunderstorm Saturday and then a definite temperature change second half of the weekend. A cold front will spark some thunderstorms. Door will be open to much cooler air at least for a couple days because I think a week from today our temperatures will be stuck in the 50s. Those clouds made of ice crystals on display again here, cirrus clouds cover the state. Temperatures range from 70 degrees in Anderson to 72 in Sullivan on the cool side, 64 in Logansport. Next three days, you see the game plan. All we're doing is adding a couple degrees each day, keeping partly to mostly sunny skies through that. Another change will be increasing winds on Wednesday. But during the day tomorrow, the wind is out of the southwest at about 10 miles per hour, 74 for the high temperature. That's 12 degrees above average for this time of year. Wind will be stronger out of the southwest on Wednesday. We'll see gusts to 25 through the day. That pulls slightly warmer temperatures into the Hoosier State. And 